kids, it's time to get some SML podcast all up in that. What's up, everybody? This is the SML Podcast. I am your host, Joe. Joining as usual, Cole. How are you doing? Hey, uh, I'm still here. <laughs> Been a while since I got to introduce you in yeah. the normal fashion because you were back that last is- episode, but we had a rassle cast. By the way, Tim's here. Tim, how are you doing? Hey, I'm mm-hmm. fine. I'm good. Well, and was, Ellen and Chris I are was, here too. I was chopped I, liver I, last episode. <laughs> I was nothing about a rassle cast, so I would have been chopped liver, but I wasn't Rass- even on the menu. Nope. <laughs> Wrestles happen on Wednesdays. And yeah. I'm here too. <laughs> Chris is here. <laughs> Hello. Chris and Purnell. I had to self introduce. <laughs> well, I did say Chris and Purnell are here. Chris and Purnell. Yeah. That's true. He got, he got fourth villain. We're a dynamic duo, so we always get <laughs> That's right. But I get then, you confused all the time. You just, <laughs> like brothers. We could, yeah. We they the sound identical. Robin, though, so, hey, that's all I care about. <laughs> They look identical. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, look at their Facebook profiles. Can I mean, you can lose different. your mind when <laughs> when game bros are introduced at the same time. Da, 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 da. Yeah. Um, what? <laughs> I have no idea what that was. <laughs> <laughs> That's a spoof on an old show. An old show. I don't even remember the name of the show. There's no when cousins are two of a kind. I don't know oh. the name of the show. Oh, fuck. What was that? Two of a kind. No, I was like, they look alike, they talk alike, they even seem to think alike. You could lose your mind, but I can't remember the title of the show. But I know (laughs) the whole damn jingle is so (laughs) annoying. So if you know what we're talking about, you could send an email to the SML podcast at gmail.com. It saved me. It still works. Add us on Twitter. (laughs) Yes, follow the (laughs) SML podcast on the Twitters. But that song that Purnell was singing. Very out of tune, like <laughs> such and such. Follow us on Send Patreon for all of Purnell singing extravaganza. <laughs> Crap, you want patrons? You know <laughs> what are you doing? You actually want to have patrons? We don't uh, we have tried that. Patreon anymore? Oh, it's the Patty Duke show. <laughs> oh, uh. there it is. There it is. Chris was wrong. Huh. Now I remember. Piss us <laughs> down. <laughs> but there, that makes sense then. Because I did used to watch Patty Duke when I was a kid. Like all the I was going to say the Patty Duke show, but. Nick at Night. But you decided to be wrong anyway. <laughs> I, I just, yeah. And Nick at Night was my thing for some reason. I, but, but really because my mom started watching it. So, of course, when it was on in the house and I could hear it, sometimes I was walking, like, which show is that? And she's like, oh, when I was a kid, that was on TV every night. And now you guys got Urkel and shit. <laughs> Hey. Uh, I think What's we made out better. <laughs> I think we I was, made out better, <laughs> personally. I was trying oh. to explain to number three the other day that, like, you had to actually, A, have either cable or an antenna, and B, like, turn the channel on the TV and then sit down <laughs> and watch it when it was on, because if you missed it or the president was on, you were SOL. And she or just sporty. thought I had, like... The way she looked at me, you thought I had a second head sprouting out of my shoulder. <laughs> she was just like completely flabbergasted. She's like, are you telling me a lie? And I was like, why would I lie to you about this? You know, the sad part is that that actually does still exist, but so few people actually use it now <laughs> that it's like it doesn't. David's parents pay for cable. I don't know why. <laughs> we had a VCR. Cough Castle content. You're like, please. Buy fact, something, or we're going to just increase your cable bill, your internet bill again. So expensive, and and the funny part about that is, up until I think it was October of last year, they had an actual like big honking tube TV. Oh my! That's, oh, that's legit. That's and they were using that, and I was like. At one point, I caught a TV on sale. It was like on clearance for like 78 bucks. And I told David, I said, for the love of God, get that for your parents. <laughs> now, how big of a TV are we talking here? Like 35, a 36, 37 inch TV? Um, or? A thir- I think it was a 32. Oh my God, that could but kill someone. It was huge. And they had it sitting on this little tiny stand. And I'm just like, 
Every time when the the girls were little, I was for the love of God, don't let them get near that TV. <laughs> it's like it's like waiting for the cat to bump into the like the leg to knock it over. When well, they don't have any pets, but when uh when they moved out of their old house and D and I moved in, and this is not as far back as you would think it was, but it was two thousand. Four, late 2004, I think it was. That's 15 years ago. Shush, shush you. It's more than that because uh, number one is 17. 17 years ago. Yeah. So it's when we down. <laughs> oh. <laughs> when we when we moved in down there, they had basically like left some of the furniture behind that they didn't want because they just moved up the road to her her parents' uh, old homestead, and so we took over theirs. And the very first thing I saw when I opened the door was one of them big honking TVs in a cabinet. <laughs> oh, no. That's one <laughs> that I the definitely floor don't need. With a big wood cabinet, and that fucker still worked. They just take up so Yeah, much. they still work. I have one behind me. It's still, you know, I got they a still work. They're just TV fucking like, heavy. Yeah, like, was, I think I got a tube TV like in 2019, actually, because I always wanted to have one for the retro game systems you know, and for light gun games. But so like mine is like 20, like 27 inches or something. And I will never move it because, yeah. <laughs> it's, the funny it, thing about that is when we bought them a, a flat panel and D took it over and set it up and... And, and they were like, you guys can't afford this. And David's like, look, the only person who tells me what I can't afford to my wife. <laughs> <laughs> if you look over, like, well, actually, we can't afford this shit. <laughs> <laughs> um, and he set it all up for him. And he was like, okay, I'm going to take this at the old TV out and put it by the trash. And they were like, you can't do that. Just take it and put it in the den. So they still have that motherfucker sitting over there in the den. <laughs> oh, God. They gotta get a flat screen TV and put it on top of the tube TV. <laughs> I, I I've guess, seen people do that. That's all it's for. I Wait, think. Really? Four I model joking. TVs. No, the people who had like the big four model TVs that are like old stereos. I've I I've seen people day, use those that. just as a TV stand. Oh, that yeah, for sure. But the fact the fact that you mentioned like a flat the how the flat TV that's something I've never seen. But I know people who use like the, the those TVs to put smaller CRTs on top. <laughs> But to hear them doing that with a flat screen just kind of blows my mind. <laughs> like, the whole point was to get rid of the fucker. <laughs> <laughs> it's lighter. <laughs> you get a smaller it's like stand. like a cabinet. <laughs> this yeah, is like, the banter we didn't have while you were gone, Cole. What, really? Literally. What did you guys yes. do? Just, like, jump into to reviews? That sounds awful. No, it we just was, had different so we banter. Yeah. Oh, what did you talk about? <laughs> Rassles and boy stuff? <laughs> yeah, boy stuff. We're talking about video games because oh, it's a video game you, podcast. Talking about wieners and girls. Spice Girls are coming back. <laughs> <laughs> the Spice Girls are coming back. I want to talk they? about wieners. Hold up. <laughs> I just made that up, but that's the boy stuff we were talking about. The Spice Girls, you know. <laughs> Wait, Tim made a promise. He said y'all talked about wieners. No, I didn't I make talk a promise. <laughs> no, it's too late. It's a promise now. That was not a promise. You said we were talking about wieners. It was a reminiscence. <laughs> How much is there to talk about regarding wiener dogs? Like, there's still lengthy <laughs> and they're adorable dogs yeah but they love to poop <laughs> that's all dogs yeah all exactly. dogs like to poop. They love <laughs> to poop like i got nothing for wiener dogs they're just adorable things that i i know like no factoids about them maybe they have like difficulties with like doctor services for their backs i don't freaking know i mean they're lengthy dogs you'd expect their back to have a little bit more challenge to them but they're still precious and that's what matters most. See, those are the kind of tangents we went on <laughs> Wiener dogs. Yeah, <laughs> we went on a Pernell tangent last week. This week it was a Cole tangent. <laughs> Mine are decidedly better. Well, yours are all family related. Well, I was talking about a TV. Your family's TV. Hey, yeah, That's David's family. I don't got to claim them. <laughs> oh, oh, don't do no loopholes. Oh here. no, you're stuck with them. Loophole, like. <laughs> Technically, <laughs> biologically, they're his. <laughs> That's his side of the tree, and I done chopped the limbs off of mine. So. <laughs> <laughs> Joe's like, I didn't miss any of this. This is shit. 
No, I like that did. shorter it's, episode. It's good to have Cole back. I'm I'm happy that she's back. I'm happy that she has power again. Uh, uh and yeah. Master Sword now? Is that what's going on? Yeah. <laughs> I'm not using not using car batteries to power <laughs> my house. Which, for the record, holy shit, that was astounding! Like that got me thinking about the need of like survival tactics and shit. <laughs> so, a car battery and this converter, and I'm powering my whole house. Me, long seventeen I'm here, dollars. Like, <laughs> that's that's ingenious shit right there. Like that's smart. I'm, I'm gonna be freaking marauding out this motherfucker. Like, give me damn. <laughs> now, were you just Hard running rate. the car, like running everything off the car battery, or were, did you have the car running to keep the battery charged? No, no, we had three batteries, three oh. car batteries. Well, one was a deep cycle marine battery because we took it out of our boat. But uh, basically, it's just like this little seventeen dollar inverter box, and it has two plug ins and two USB ports on it. And it was on clearance at Harbor Freight. <laughs> and um, you hook it up, you know, black to negative, red to positive or whatever it is on a car battery. And then you just plug in a power supply strip. And there you go. You could run whatever. Now, the one, the $17 one was like, it would start up at 800 watts, but it would power down to 400. So you couldn't run anything that was more than 400 watts off of it. And if you had too much shit plugged in and your battery was starting to get low, it'd make this god-awful beep sound. And it would make you want to gouge your ears out with rusty spoons. <laughs> <laughs> it was horrible. And it would happen at like 4 a.m. <laughs> um, but yeah, just as long as like, the, as long as you had the the box for the router and there's there's a box outside our house that our Wi-Fi comes, or not our Wi-Fi, but um, our cable Pl- or um, plugs into for the internet. Okay. And as long as we had power going to that box and to the router, we could access the internet. Mm. And so you could like, you know, plug in one of the, I have a Chromebook. The girls had Chromebooks for school. Like we could, we could plug in that stuff and charge them up and then take them off. And not so they weren't constantly running on the battery. Yeah. And then you'd, you know, have three or four hours with the Chromebook or whatever and could at least browse the internet, maybe watch some Netflix and not go completely stir crazy. But Did it the was the switch get played a lot? Yeah, once they were able to charge it. Because <laughs> see it's for the first few days we didn't have the inverter. Like the, the power went out February thirteenth and we were like, Oh, it'll be back on tomorrow. And then it wasn't. And then um Sunday came and went, power didn't come on. And Monday, the the news was like, you know, there's a big ice storm coming and, and you need to prepare. Um, that's when, I don't remember if I talked about it on the last show episode or not, but that's when David tried to go out and get propane and things like that and actually got stuck outside of the house as trees were falling all around us. <laughs> and he walked. His parents actually slept in their car at the mouth of the holler because they got trapped out. And then um, they were eventually able, the 911 was able, the constable was able to come and get them to their friend's house in town. But David had to walk from the mouth of the holler to the house. It was 25 degrees. It was raining. There was lightning. And trees were falling all around. And he was carrying a 20-pound propane cylinder. So, like, it was actually dangerous enough that she could have fallen next to him. Well, it actually was to the point where one fell. He was climbing, like, under the fallen trees and, and over them with that cylinder, walking home. And he was over a mile away. And then um, one fell relatively close to him and actually hit the horse who was in the field across from our house. Like and so landed on the horse? It, yeah, it, like the road stopped it enough that it didn't um, injure her, but it was laying across her back. And she's pregnant. Um, so he actually, at that point, left the road and went down into the field to, to get her loose from that tree. And he wasn't able to see any lights on in the house, obviously, no phone or anything. And he was standing in the field and he just screamed and I heard it 
And I got up and I put a candle in the window so he could see the house and get to the house. Wow. Um, but at that time, he stopped at one point and he was standing in the middle of the road. And there's a tree like outside of our house in the front yard. And then I went into the girls' room. So basically, like, I'm in the house, but I have the window open. David's on the the um, road, and we're kind of at a diagonal from each other. And the tree is in between us. And he says, are you okay? And I said, yeah, we're fine. Get your ass in the house. <laughs> mm-hmm. And at that moment, half that, that tree split in half and fell between us. Jesus. That's oh, ter- that man. sounds terrifying to me. And so then he managed to to get around. The only reason, under normal circumstances, he would have actually cut up through the yard at that point. But we actually fenced in that part of the yard last year, and he couldn't do that. If he had gone his usual path, he would have been under that tree. Damn. So he went around the house and and got in. It took him. It took him three and a half hours. Jesus, there's something to be said the about these kinds of stories, though, because like at the time. That had to be terrifying as all get yeah. out. But yeah. now it's all over and done and you're past it. So now it's a, that's a story you'll be telling for years. It's still a scary story. I, I do know I said this on the last show, but I'll reiterate. Like there's a there's a little bit of an element of like trauma kind of just hanging in there. Because Dumb and Dumber up here were shooting their guns the other night. Oh, and I geez. just I found my because they're dumb and dumber, right? And I found myself just kind of sitting here with my hand over my heart and just kind of holding my breath while he did it because the sound of the gunfire mimicked the sound of those trees popping as they fell. And I I just like, I was ready to climb out of my skin having to hear that. That is terrible. This is two episodes in a row. I have to find a way to segue that into video game review. I know what I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Well, that sounds like it sucks. You know what else sucks? (laughs) (laughs) Oh, my God. Oh, God. Very good. There you go. There's your segue. What's first up? I don't don't know if the first game sucks. So. (laughs) (laughs) If it doesn't, like, well, that You know what, mate or mate? I can change my review on the fly. (laughs) (laughs) We'll make it work. work. (laughs) Yeah, we'll make it work. Yeah, all these games suck tonight. There you go. They're all terrible. They're all terrible. Oh, no. Joe with the hot takes. No, nah, there's some good ones in here. Should we talk about them? Sure. Hopefully, let's find out. All right, let's get to this. First game to talk about tonight is called Pixel Game Maker Series Puzzle Pedestrians, developed by Route 24, published by Gotcha Gotcha Games Incorporated, released March 3rd on PC, March 4th on Switch for $14.99. Observe and guide pedestrians to help them have a safe time on their way to work, school, or otherwise fulfilling your mission objectives. With your toolkit of items such as bees and bananas, you'll help moms deliver lunches to forgetful children, deliver more foot traffic to struggling shops, and so much more. Chris, tell us about Puzzle Pedestrians. Sucks like an ice storm in Kentucky. Next game. Boom. (laughs) (laughs) Damn. Damn. Him with the interference. (laughs) (laughs) Denied. (laughs) Just took that ball and ran with it. Yeah. All right. So next we're going to talk about entire reviews. Now it's your turn. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I'll I'll be good. (laughs) That's his. That's as far as my my basketball analogies go. <laughs> <laughs> That's another interference. Actually, isn't that football? Yeah. Oh <laughs> yeah. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> we still love you. I don't watch sports either. <laughs> I only know video game sports, and that doesn't help. <laughs> <laughs> See what you okay. need is your power smash tech. Oh yeah, yeah. See, that's what I know. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Pixel <laughs> Game Maker Series Puzzle Pedestrians. All right, so this is a um, this is a game that was made in. Uh, actually, it was a thing I was not aware of, even though they've got six games now on the Switch. But there is a program called Pixel Game Maker MV um, that you can download. It's you know a very basic like no coding type game maker tool, mm-hmm. and. Um, I guess one of the the unique uh, features that they uh, that they espouse is the fact that they have like this 
really short pipeline from making your game on their program that you download from like Steam or whatever, and actually publishing on Nintendo Switch. So I'm actually and, kind of surprised uh, it's not on the Switch because I'm thinking by yeah, the title it's, it's associated with RPG Maker MV, which is yeah, 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 so. yeah. They're not on Switch, but you can publish on Switch. So this is one of those games, uh, the newest of such, I believe. And um, yeah, this one is notable as well because it was planned and produced by Kenichi Nishi, uh, who runs Route 24. And he is known for having worked on uh, Moon Remix RPG Adventure, which is uh, one of my favorite recent games that I won't say anything about because they didn't give it to us to review. <laughs> so I had to purchase it with my money, therefore I can remain Fuck silent you. on it. <laughs> uh, he also helped. Uh, he also worked on Chibi Robo, which is another of my favorites from back in the day. Um, and this game, free? do what? Did they give Chibi Robo to us for free to review? Yeah, I I wish that game is then <laughs> nothing to I'll say. say about. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, yeah, I have nothing to say about <laughs> Chibi Robo either. If you don't have a few hundred dollars uh, to spend, or you don't already have it, then don't bother. <laughs> That's how much it goes for? The couple hundred? That's uh, a pricey think, one. Yeah, I, I think it's it's gone up that far. Uh, I haven't checked it in a few months, though. It might have fluctuated back down. Who knows? But, uh, well, yeah. Let's look up on eBay. <laughs> well, better look up on eBay during this, to this review, Joe. <laughs> during this review of Puzzle Pedestrians. No, I swear to God, I will, uh, I will review another game within this review. Just you watch. <laughs> so, Pixel Game Maker also published something called Werewolf Princess Kaguya, which right. has the greatest intro of any game. I will read it for you. Um, because, because I've just been challenged. I need to look at my pictures because it's. It I like took a quiet. screenshot of it. Kim, you're really quiet. Oh, well, I was being quiet on purpose. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't help. <laughs> this is this is another pixel maker, a uh, pixel game maker series game that has nothing to do with puzzle pedestrian. Kaguya, a cursed girl who transforms into a wolf. She said goodbye to her grandfather and grandmother and set out on a journey to a city with a spaceship to defeat her mother, the Moon Queen. I'd That's the entire that. story. Wow. <laughs> Sounds autobiographical to me. Yeah, I mean, yeah, clearly it's based on a real person. Okay. Anyway, Chibi Robo goes for about 150. Oh, okay, 150. All right. I think I saw it for like 200 or something at one point, I but see. yeah. I don't anyway, know, man. Puzzle Pedestrians, we should probably <laughs> talk about this game that we're reviewing. Well, that's the thing is that it's there's not a whole lot to talk about with this game. I've been purposely padding this uh, on purpose <laughs> <laughs> because what it is a lot of peas involved in this review. Yeah, that's as soon as you uh, Purnell's purpose. As soon as, oh. as, soon as you wade through the rather lengthy loading screen, um, which is what I feel like people wanting to hear this review are doing. Um, the game starts, it basically has you select your level and then play. There's no options in the game. There's new game and continue. That's it. But that's, you know, you don't need much, I guess. Um, it basically shows a city. It's a map and it has certain like points on it. And you've got a goal that is established at the beginning of the stage. So like, um, there's one for like, uh, get this guy and this girl to meet each other. And they're both on different parts of the the map walking in basically kind of in their own direction, but you've got like 20 seconds to get them together. Uh, your tools to do that are what you set in those spots in the city. And uh, with the correct timing, it will cause your characters to uh, change course or otherwise it will affect their path so that eventually they can bump into each other. Um, your tools starting out are things like banana peels and bees. <laughs> so, <laughs> The, what the else first, do you need? <laughs> the first several levels, like almost, almost a, a an un, uh, an unreasonable amount of levels, involve like putting people in the path of bees, <laughs> <laughs> and they serve a dual purpose. If you put the bees, uh, like in front of them, like at a uh, at a crosswalk, it will cause them to change direction because they don't want to walk into bees. So you know they'll they'll change their path, and Makes that sense. you know that can help. I would change my path. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or you can put the bees on the spot as they're walking over it, and that will cause them to sprint because they don't want to be in the middle of where all these bees just showed up. So it's things <laughs> bees like that. that just uh, magically teleported. Oh, God. <laughs> Magical teleporting <laughs> bees. 
I don't know if you've ever been in the middle of a bunch of bees before, but that's kind of what it's like. <laughs> um, but anyways, so, you know, it starts off innocuous enough like that. And but I feel like the game's description is burying the lead a little bit because, like, uh, it doesn't even take like nine or ten levels before you are um, using similar tools. And, of course, like I said, banana peels, lots of banana peels, lots of um, lots of bees to uh, help a police officer apprehend zombies. Um, you are helping an alien being collect her children before the cops find them <laughs> and uh <laughs> those levels are insane like <laughs> uh there's just all kinds of stuff happening like in this game like and then it'll just be like something like bring more customers to the coffee shop <laughs> and it's like arrest those zombies with bees <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> The game is wacky, but, you know, it's got exactly one thing that you do, and that's set traps in order to solve a puzzle. And the timer on it uh, is really the big enemy, because while you can figure out, like, these pathways, like, you not only have to figure them out, you have to figure them out efficiently. And you'll end up uh, starting levels over again a lot, because you'll end up with, like, less than one second on the clock uh, before you win in a in a good game like you have to be Ooh. that precise yeah so the game does get pretty difficult uh pretty quickly but like i said you know it's fun um there's no penalty for losing you just you know start it over again and you know try again um but you know like i said there's there's nothing like no options to speed things up there's no like uh no difficulty settings there's not even music settings or anything like that so it's it's very bare bones in as in terms of that but conceptually i love the game um and it's pretty fun to play and you know despite the difficulty spike like nothing ever felt impossible it just like it really it does work your brain so on that level i actually do appreciate it cool so 15 bucks on it what do you say Oh, 15 bucks is actually kind of a hard ask, uh, especially when uh, Werewolf Princess Kaguya is only 10 bucks and I just yeah. bought it. <laughs> <laughs> I actually purchased it sight unseen. Um, yeah, they have a handful of games available. There's The Witch in the 66 Mushrooms, Puzzle yeah. Makeout, Le or no, that's Pixel Puzzle Makeout. Totally different. <laughs> no, uh, Dungeons of Nazarek, Nazarek. Remote yeah. Bomber. They even have a Game Maker player, so you could just browse and, and play other games. Yeah, I think I I think I downloaded that at some point. Is that the one that costs like $2 or something? Well, the player is free. Oh, okay. Then that's not the one I got. <laughs> <clears throat> I bought some other MVs like um, player game for like 2 bucks. But anyways, so uh, yeah, I just reviewed like 5 games. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, right. I was going to say 15 bucks. I think that, yeah, it is worth it. If this sounds like a um, like a, a fun kind of puzzle game for you, uh, certainly the quality of the puzzles is there, and that's kind of all it needs to be. And it is ludicrous. Like, you will, you know, actually laugh at this game a few times for a game with barely any text. That's <laughs> a pretty good... Um, Pretty good recommendation. Um, otherwise, you know, I would maybe wait for it to go on sale or something. But if you do want to, um, but if like me, you want to support Route 24 and, you know, somebody who worked on Moon and Chibi Robo, then by all means, yeah, go ahead and purchase this. <clears throat> that way you don't have to drop 150 bucks on eBay for Chibi Robo. Yeah, see, there you go. Cool. <laughs> 200 right. for a complete copy. <laughs> Oof. Jeez. Where is my copy? I'm going to find that. <laughs> it makes it complete manual and box. I would yeah. never sell my Chibi Robo. <sighs> never say never. No, 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 never. I won't hey, sell I... my Cubivore either, and it's worth twice that. Oh, yeah. But no, I do have a Cubivore. A cardboard I, box. I still have my Cubivore. Sweet <laughs> Cubivore. <laughs> hey, I sold, I sold my Panzer Dragoon Saga. Wow. Damn. And now I don't have credit card debt. So, <laughs> yeah. <There you> go. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, and next... neither will. Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. I was just going to say, and neither will Kenichi Nishi if enough people um, pay 15 bucks for his game. <laughs> yes, there you go. <laughs> All right. Well, next game to talk about is called Dreaming Sarah, developed by Asterisk Studios, published by Rattlelake Games, released March 5th on Xbox One, Series X and S, PS4, PS5, and Switch for $4.99. 
Screaming Sarah is a surreal adventure platformer game with puzzle elements, an engaging environment, an incredibly diverse cast of characters, and of course, a young girl named Sarah. Sarah's been in an accident and is currently in a coma and it is up to you to help her wake up by exploring her dream world. Mm. Tim, tell us about Dreaming Sarah. All right, Dreaming Sarah. Uh, this is a weird, oddball, little puzzle platformer adventure exploration type deal here. Um, where, yeah, okay. They, I'm glad they explained a lot of the premise there. So I don't have to, I was like, not sure whether like (laughs) how much of the story was revealed ahead of time. So yeah, she was in an accident. Uh, the nature of that accident, you might find out along the way. Um, and she's in a coma. Does she get out of that coma? You might find out along the way. (laughs) Uh, stay tuned to find out. So yeah, you're Sarah. You might find out. along. You might find out. Might find out. Can't say for sure. I don't know if her name is actually ever. Mm, I don't know. That could be a lie. Not sure. Um, probably not. We'll find out but, along uh, the way. <laughs> we'll find out along the way. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so yeah, you uh, you're you're in this game. It's a it's a two D sprite based uh, side scrolly sort of deal. Um, you walk around. You jump. You explore the world. Uh, there are. Some, you know, it's kind of like, it's not, it's not a big game. Um, like all told, like I beat this game in like an hour to, to two hours. It's not like a huge type, uh, not, not like a huge sprawling multi-hour brain busting adventure. Uh, it, it is not that this is, this is a, a small bite sized chunk of game. So you, uh, get out in the world, you start out in this forest, you start walking around, you might get some clues to this or that. There's some like weird people standing around you can talk to. Um, but you start picking up items like the first item you pick up is an umbrella, which lets you, uh, kind of glide way after you jump. So you can make it over larger gaps, which then you can start exploring more parts of the world. So, you, but yeah, you start out in this forest and it's like, okay, this is cool. Uh, you know, you get the umbrella, you go over a couple gaps. Um, and, and at some point or another, things are going to start getting really weird, uh, because you're going to step out of that forest in one way or another. It might be because you go down into a cave and find a broken TV and go inside the TV. And then inside the TV, you find a rocket ship that takes you to another planet on that planet is a bar. And that takes you somewhere else. And it's just like, okay, well, <laughs> holy shit. Uh, like that's, that's the kind of thing you're, you're dealing with here. I, I uh, was interested in the game cause I watched the trailer and I saw you in a big, weird toothy looking mouth. And I was like, okay, this seems like strange enough for me to, to spend some time with. <laughs> um, so you start kind of bouncing between, uh, different, uh, worlds, dimensions, planes of existence, uh, dreamscapes, what have you. Uh, and you will along the way, you know, you pick up items, that some are just kind of like collectibles uh, that will give you a trophy or an achievement, I guess, depending on what a uh, system you're on there. Um, and some are like useful for, you know, you have the umbrella, but then you will also get like, uh, oh God, what's the next? There's a, there's a compass that will point you in the direction of important items. There is like some glasses you will, you can put on that will reveal things that are hidden. Um, and you make use of these items to help you find your way through other areas, different areas of the game, uh, and keep exploring further and further until you find your way to the game's dramatic conclusion. What could it be? I don't know. I'm not going to tell you. We'll find out um, along the way. You'll find out along the way. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's kind of, that's it. That's the game. Really. There's <laughs> not much, to, uh, again, much like, uh, the puzzle pedestrian, there's not a whole lot to talk about here. Um, but it is fun and neat and engaging, uh, and not overly long, which is a plus in my book. Uh, a lot of the time. Um, yeah, the it's, slice it's of a cool. game for a slice of a price. Yeah. It, yeah. For only five bucks. Um, yeah, it's, that that's like well worth it. That is appropriate, really pl- appropriately priced, uh, for something you can just kind of download and be in, in a sitting in, in an afternoon and, you know, kind of see some go on a bit of a weird journey, uh, along the way. Pernell, did you dabble in this one? I did. Um, I ended up liking the game myself, but the only two things I figured that are worth pointing out were that one, uh, the narrative, so to speak, is pretty much non-existent, except for maybe at the end, um, <laughs> which I didn't see, because 
And he's like, you might come across the guys like, hi, I'm sitting on a bench. Here's some seeds or dude in cave. Like, hey, bro, I'm looking for treasure or something. But mm-hmm. like, I never really came across something that was like, give me any exposition, like saying like, hey, this is what's going on. And that may be because of the second thing I would point out, which is that uh, this game seems like it would be short. But the weird thing about it that could go either way for some people is that they, I feel like they kind of intended for you to find items in a certain, you know, like, flow. And if you happen to, like, say, accidentally miss one and you don't know where it was, you can find yourself kind of just, like, wandering about, like, how the hell was I supposed to get here? I don't know. And that wandering actually calls me to create a glitch that made me have to restart the game. Oh, my gosh. Uh, <laughs> so it's not really a spore because it's just, like, a bunch of one of many gajillion items in the game. But uh, I got the necklace that lets you turn to a fish. and I was still trying to figure out what to do in the freaking desert area because there's a part where you just keep looping in circles over and over again. I was like, there's got to be a way to solve that. So I was like, maybe if I turn into a fish, I can dive underwater and figure something out. So I went back there, turned into a fish, changed screens, and the game locked. Oh, God. Way so, to go. Good job, Pernell. pointing out, <laughs> I broke it, dreaming, collapsing, Sarah. Cole, um, are you proud? <laughs> very much so. No, I'm see. glad to see I passed on the, the torch to somebody else who can <laughs> accurately break things. That's what I like to hear. But yeah, like, I was so shocked. I was like, you gotta be kidding me. I actually just, the game just froze. So, like, That's interesting. At that point, like, I booted it up again and then came across a grandfather clock and ran around that for a bit. And I was like, okay, I'm done for the night. And <laughs> what ended up happening, which is ultimately, I was having fun with the game. It's just between the glitch and also that element of, like, I must have missed something because now I'm kind of stuck. <laughs> it's like, it kind of left me in this weird bind. I'm betting what I missed was the glasses because they could clearly be seen, but I couldn't reach the damn thing. So, it was like, well. Oh, oh, you didn't get the glasses. Yeah. I was staring them in the damn face. I was like, I can't get up there. You it's might funny. have missed. There's something. Gosh, I don't remember what it is. It's, like, right outside that house that has the glasses in it. Um, <laughs> that lets you get to the glasses. Uh, I don't remember what it is, but yeah. <laughs> well, we'll put that up again, like, because honestly, I want to see the end because, like I say, even though I didn't really get any real, like, I, didn't, I wasn't really grabbing any narrative elements as I was playing it, I was actually enjoying solving the bit by bit puzzles. I was like, oh, I got this, and I can do this. Oh, wow, the screen just turned red. I wonder what's going on with that. This nightclub is really shady. I wonder what's happening in here. <laughs> like, the nightclub is really shady. It's very shady. Like, I enjoyed those elements, and it definitely gave off the impression of I'm wandering through a dream. That's why all this is so, like, j- like disconnected in its own weird way. Like, I like that very much. So, well, five bucks on it. What do you two think? Oh, yeah. I think it's totally worth it. Absolutely. Ditto here. Yeah. Just listen to, if you're listening to the review developers, please work on the fish glitch or at least put up a sign <laughs> away that says no fish here. That'd be good. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking fish. Yeah, when oh. I got the fish thing, I was pretty close to the end of the game, so I, I did not end up wandering back into the desert. Oh. So maybe they maybe were thinking the same thing. like, no, no one in their right mind's going to need to come into the <laughs> desert after getting the shell necklace. And then Pernell comes all like, I fucking lost. <laughs> Could you show me the way to Shell Beach? Oh, shit. All right. Well, that's it for you, Tim. Uh, we will yep. let you get going. Do you have any final words? Nope. I'm going to go out with a lamer bang than AW Revolution. <laughs> <laughs> Good night. <laughs> Good oh, night. I get that joke, and no one else does. Yeah. Is that wrestle casting? Yes, Rassles. it's it's wrestling. <laughs> Womp womp. Yeah. A, a giant womp womp on, on wrestling on Sunday. Yes. But, uh, moving on. Oh. Next game to talk about is called Killer Queen Black, developed by Liquid Bit and Bumble Bear Games, published by Liquid Bit, released February 23rd on Xbox One for $19.99. An epic platform strategy game for up to eight players online or locally. Play Killer Queen Black casually in quick play matches, up the intensity in ranked matches, or invite friends to a private room. Easy to play, hard to master, fun for all. Brunel, tell us about your time with Killer Queen Black. It might not be fun for someone if they suck at it, but uh, <laughs> but all jokes aside, I don't think really this is one of those games where I deeply feel like you can't really suck at it. You could be worse than other players, but I think you can still put forth a decent effort and have fun with it. But as for what the actual game is, so 
It is a 2D team based action platformer, uh, like sport esque title with the concept that that makes it special being that it has multiple win conditions. So you're on 4v4 teams and the object of every match is one of three things. <clears throat> one of them is collecting berries. So one of the unit types is a worker. Workers can collect berries that are scattered around the map and bring them back to the hive. If you can fill the hive grid with berries before the other team does, you can win. That's called an economic victory. The second victory type is a military victory. So the second unit type in the game is the queen bee. Queen bee it catches from a hive. She can fly. She can dash upwards and she can run horizontally and vertically. And if she collides with someone during a dash, she kills them. She can also, well, I'll get in that in a second, but um, she has one other function. But if the queen can be murdered by the opposing team three times, the opposing team will win. That is called a military victory. And the last victory, and by far my favorite victory, <laughs> is the snail victory. Every map has Ooh. a snail positioned on it. One of the worker B units can land on top of it and slowly drag it to the other side of the map. And if they can get it over there, they will win the match. However, the opposing team can either kill the worker as he's on the snail, or as a queen or a soldier B, which I can also mention shortly, or they can take a worker B and run in front of the snail, causing the snail to stop what it's doing and eat the worker, <laughs> thereby killing that player, but also slowing the snail down. And one of my <laughs> favorite animations in video game history. It's such a great animation. The guy's like clawing at the ground. He's getting dragged in. But you're also sitting there as the player and you're like, but you ran to the snail. What the hell did you expect? <laughs> you chose this death, buddy. You won. Um, so... Um, across, strewn across the map to kind of alter and tweak the gameplay aside from the, just the workers and the queens are special gates. These special gates have one of two options on them being pertaining to specific powers you can unlock for that worker. And what you do is if you want to take on one of these soldier B powers, you have to carry a berry to it, press up in front of the gate and choose left or right which power you want that has the, the gate has available. Now, Normally, they're available to any player that can reach them. However, a queen bee unit can actually fly up to them and take control of it so that only members of their team can use it. It's pretty sneaky stuff, and it allows for a bit of area control in the game in addition to everything else that's going on. Um, so what ends up happening is you combine all these elements, you wind up with a very frenetic game to the sense where like, sometimes... A player team will win using a method that no one else is even noticing happening, like mm -hmm. the snail victory. Someone's not watching the snail because they're too busy fighting for berries and killing queens. Not <laughs> black. Uh, they will ultimately just win because the snail crosses the finish line. You're too busy and focusing on the snail and all of a sudden the opponent has an economic victory because you weren't paying attention to the berries. Yep. And it's so cool in that regard. It requires every player to be on their toes. And it also allows certain players to try to do the stealth bit. Like, admittedly, you, like, you can actually watch the other players if you see if they're noticing you, but you can kind of play around and be like, okay, I see everybody scrambling on the right side of the screen. I'll just kind of drag around slowly on the left, and maybe they won't notice me doing my thing. But uh, it's surprisingly engaging and fun. These are the types of games I usually play because I suck at team based games. <laughs> I always want, I'm always, it's like the guy at a, at a college paper project. I'm doing all the work. Because I don't trust my team to do their putting their fair shares. <laughs> um, so I'm bad at these games. But with that said, I find myself really enjoying this. Because even if I don't want to do anything like be the queen, which for the record, I never want to be the queen because I don't like the pressure that comes with being <laughs> the queen. Uh, Under I, pressure. <laughs> Speaking of queen. I just love controlling how worker unit and running for that snail. That's become my favorite way to play. Though if I can't do that, then I will occasionally do some very sneakage going get some very sneakage going on or protect the snail rider. But uh you have a number of options available to you as you play the game. If you're the type of person that never wants to be the queen, you don't have to be the queen. You just put in the settings that you don't want to play as the queen, the game pretty much won't set it. Though I wonder if the game will just assume someone has to be if every player chooses I don't want to be the queen, but I got a feeling that's rarely ever happened. So 
I don't know. Um, something else that rarely happens is someone dropping bits, but Staggerilla just dropped 100 bitties, so thank you so much, Stag. Excellent segue. Right. I try. <laughs> yes, excuse me. <laughs> uh, anyway, but, tell us about these flat, fat bottom girls, Brunel. Fat bottom bees, they rock the world. Are there any bicycles uh, in wow. this? Wow. <laughs> Who worked that? Intentionally, and by defense, it was intentional. Uh, holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> holy hell, dogs. He really screwed that food. Uh, but now, this game is honestly a lot of fun. I only wish that it had a single player mode, but it, by design, you are specifically meant to play with other people, whether it's online or your couch. So don't come into this game expecting to get like this awesome single player experience because you get a very short tutorial and your ass is thrown to the wolves. Good luck, sucker. Um, but the game is not too complicated, so that's not really a bad fate at all. But importantly enough, <clears throat> you cannot play this game without other people. Um, though I will also say that though team voice chat is a thing in the game, I never use it because I don't fucking like talking to strangers on the internet. It's almost <laughs> like my mom taught me well. Uh, so I played without voice chat, and it still works. Like The game plays very well in that regard. Um I have nothing but nice things to say about this game, which is funny because I owned it on the Switch before getting this review code, and this is what inspired me to finally play the game, and now I play it on my Switch and on the Xbox. It's got that so, cross-play, so... Right, which is something more games need. That way you don't have to worry about if you bought it for the right console or not. All yeah. you have to be concerned about, I bought it, let's play. And best you know? of all, it's on Game Pass. Boom! That's that's that was that's ingenious right there. How to do that? When you bring in a game that requires online playing, you make it free initially, at least. Getting that initial flood of people in there makes it so that people who buy the game can actually enjoy it because they're not there's not a drought of players, or at least there's less chance of there being a drought of players. Yeah. So, Chris, what did you think with of uh, your time with Killer Queen Black? I liked it. Um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it. Uh, <laughs> I'm actually it's definitely good. It's gonna fun. get it on. I mean, yeah, what it else is, fun. is there to say, really? Yeah, I want to get it on um, on Switch as well, so that when we can finally have friends over again, I'll have a new four player game that can perhaps give some competition to Toast Time Smash 'Em Up. <laughs> but we don't know. That's we'll a pretty see. hot one. Paul, did you play this one at all, or were you still uh, without too. power I, with this one? I have it installed, but I did not get time to play it, it's and I'm okay. bummed about it. Because this is the kind of shit I would play. Well, I think the four of us should get together and uh, team up and <gasps> take some motherfuckers down sometime. Thank you. Yeah, Killer Queen! So, Purnell, 20 bucks. Your thoughts on Killer Queen Black? Worth the scratch and then some, so long as you're okay with it. Actually, not, I'm not going to get that caveat. You heard the review. I think it's worth the money. <laughs> and it's on Game Pass if you have an Xbox. So, do that. Uh, next game to talk about is As Divine Cross, developed by XCreate, published by Chemco, released March 5th on Xbox One, Series X and S, and Windows 10 for $14.99. RV, an outlaw of little importance, gets himself trapped deep in his kingdom's dungeons. While in prison, he befriends a mysterious woman who claims to be the princess of the lands. Together, the two begin an escape that spans far beyond jail bars as both friends and enemies begin to surface. RV realizes that the world of As Divine is anything but at peace. Chris, tell us about As Divine Cross. Okay, so As Divine Cross um, is a Chemco X Create RPG, and uh, <laughs> that says well, a think- lot right there. It does say a lot. It says almost all of it, really. Um, Which is I why I just- bought it already. <laughs> <laughs> well, like I was thinking to myself, man, it would be really nice to like just write up a template for a review of a Chemco X create game and then just like (laughs) plug in information where it, where it varies. That way I could be making a review. That's like a Chemco X create game. (laughs) You could, you could call it Chemco RPG review, the unique experience, the unique experience. (laughs) Yes. Um, because I was just thinking about like, yeah, different things. And also, uh, by the way, full disclosure, I reviewed this game about four years ago on the 3DS. It was, uh, I think about the fifth or sixth Chemco RPG that I <laughs> reviewed up for this show. Damn. Um, Happy anniversary, Chris. <laughs> yeah. So if you want to hear me stumble through a, a, another review of this same game, then go to episode 299. <laughs> Um, Look at you. Which I just, 
yeah, I know. I still happen to remember it. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even listen to the whole thing. <laughs> uh, and that was back before Party Cast. So it was just like, here's Joe and Purnell, and then here's Joe and Chris. Yep. Yes. I, was, I like this format better. Me too. Anyways, um, but I'm going to retread a lot. So don't, don't listen to that episode. Actually, maybe listen to it. Someone might listen, right? Yeah. Um, as we Divine Cross. <laughs> yes. As Divine Cross is actually um, a much, well, uh, on top of the fact that, you know, I reviewed it four years ago, like, it's even older than that. Um, I think it goes back to 2015. It's one of the earlier games in the As Divine series. However, uh, this does not follow the storyline of As Divine Hearts or um, As Divine Kimura or, um, oh, what's the other one? I was going to be impressive, but I'm As not Divine going to. Divine Dios. Now. Thank you. That's the other one that I reviewed. There's so many as um, divines. There are lots of as divines and they, they honestly don't have a lot of crossover, but this is one of the older X create games. So it's definitely going to, uh, and it's around the time that they came out with, An- um, Antiquia hearts, which is the one that, because I like that one the most, I, I tend to refer to that one as like, uh, kind of the salient exemplar of like, you know, Kemco RPGs and, uh, well, X create, <laughs> In Kemco RPGs. Um, so like that, it is basically, it follows the, uh, the story of a male protagonist, always a male protagonist, who uh, very quickly comes into contact with the secondary protagonist, who is always female, and always maybe, maybe not a love interest. Um, or a childhood friend. Or childhood friend, yes. Also love interest. Also maybe, maybe <laughs> or not childhood love interest. Love interest. <laughs> <laughs> and uh yeah their their whole dynamic is that okay so the male protagonists of every chemco x create rpg tend to alternate or at least um have a 50 50 shot of either being a kind of uh you know good guy just wants to help completely motivated by um by virtue etc or just like a complete misanthropic jerk who you know tends to like but he tends to talk down to everybody, but in doing so kind of accidentally provides the, uh, the game's tutorial while he's talking down to this girl about how to jump down short ledges and things. Literally this game stops and I like at least two and a half minutes takes like about that long to explain the concept of treasure chests. <laughs> like, and they try to write around that and everything like trying to write around why there's a treasure chest in a cave and um you know whether they're successful or not i don't know but anyway the uh so yeah harvey who also has like this vest that kind of looks like a a biker jacket um is our our protagonist and yeah he's a thief he goes to jail and um he's also like the least interesting of the thief characters (laughs) like you're kind of like oh we get to follow this guy huh (laughs) anyway like his boss is way cooler (laughs) <laughs> um and yeah he meets the ingenue um who is has this weird tale of like how she's a princess who escaped from persecution by substituting herself with a magic clone and the magic clone is like too good uh at being the princess so people think she's the clone um and you know neither of us actually knows uh chemco x create games love to throw like especially in the alfadia series they love to throw in like clone references and things like that so that that happens often of course that's a uh that's a cheap way to reuse or a good way to reuse assets for cheap <laughs> now uh they go along an adventure and stuff and like i said it's it's very um in the five years ago chemco x create uh vein so it's like uh you have the lottery system of course you have the tickets and um also points that you can win from battle um that let you either purchase items um, of course, some of those items are uh, purchasable through DLC. You could spe- easily spend another thirty dollars on this game to make it laughably easy because <laughs> it, it already has. I thought it was like twenty. Yeah, it was like twenty something. There's like three five dollar ones and like a four dollar one and a two dollar one and like another five dollar one or something. But it's, let's it's say the usual Chemco DLC that isn't yeah. mandatory, but it just makes it easier. No, it's really not, because this game has four difficulty levels, and two of them are very easy. So, I mean, 
unless you're just really, really wanting to sail through this, or unless you decided you were hardcore and started it in like the hardest mode, but then we're like, oh, I, but I need more experience. <laughs> um, either way. And it also has the items eating items feature, which I've mentioned um, many times. It's basically where if you have an item that, like a sword, and then you get a, another sword that is like stronger or weaker or whatever, you can uh, choose a sword and then have it, uh, and then basically combine it with the other weapon, and that will give it its own pool of experience points and sometimes uh, status effects that will transfer if they're uh, high enough. Okay, so there's all that. Um, what sets this game apart, and this is unusual for an X-Create game, um, because oftentimes it's the male protagonist, it's a secondary um, protagonist, and then it is uh, two other characters, just end of sentence. <laughs> like, you know, they the two other characters usually matter so little that oftentimes they'll just, like, throw in something like a cat to see if you <laughs> notice. <laughs> So <laughs> that's Antiquia Lost, by the way. <laughs> Anyways, uh, in this one, the third character that you run into kind of makes the game um, both weird and more fun. Uh, the third character is Lucille, and she is a mage who um, both mechanically and in the story um, is at her best when dealt physical pain. And that is to say she's kind of a sexual masochist. Oh, um, God. <laughs> So if she if she gets hit, she gets very excited. <laughs> and the game plays this up for as many awkward points as it possibly can. Uh, <laughs> more so than, uh, well, like, the only more awkward game, I think, in the X-Create library is, um, uh, oh, what's it called? I had it. It was on, uh, never mind. I'll get back to it. Alta Vista Chronicles. No. Alvastia. Yeah, I think it's Alvastia Chronicles. <laughs> Because that's the one that's got the brother and sister who are um, who are way too friendly. Yeah, Alta um, Vista was the search engine. Yes, but that's how I remembered <laughs> Alvastia, <laughs> and that's the one where you can uh, where you can like have a party like full of things like plants and like filing cabinets and stuff like that, all of which have personalities. <laughs> like it, a, another great game that has my recommendation, but yeah. She is a uh, she's a masochist, and of course the game plays her against. She's also like a big jerk head too, so the game you know plays her off against the hero, and oftentimes she'll end up getting hit or something like that, and then she'll get off on it, and you know awkward moment ensues. But mechanically in battle, she actually has kind of a blue mage aspect. So if an enemy hits her with a certain move, she will learn that move, hmm. and it actually becomes really fun. It gets you to um maybe not just burn through all the um all the battles with your best attacks like maybe you actually want to slow down and learn some stuff so she's pretty cool and um i think that she kind of makes this game um apart from that it is an x create rpg uh if this is your first one i'd say it's a good one um it's not as advanced as like even the later as divine um games and certainly not like you know in the ones that make that came out in the last couple of years, those tend to be tend to have a lot more systems and things like that. And like, you know, formation combats and whatever. No, this one's extremely straightforward. Um, but as such, it's entertaining enough. And like the weird thing about these Chemco X create RPGs is as many of them as there are. And there's so many of them. They're all, they all have at least this minimum standard of quality that if they were the only one of their kind that you played, you'll have a good time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, 15 bucks, what do you say? I always say they're worth it, and this one's no different. Um, yeah, this is definitely a huge upgrade from the, the 3DS game, of course, and the mobile game from which both of those sprouted. So if you are considering As Divine Cross, this is going to be the ideal um, version of that game for you because a, a lot of this stuff, like I think um, they did add back in some like things that they took out of the 3DS version. Um, so it actually does have more features. I just can't recall what they are right mm. now, but, um, but yeah, it's worth checking out. It's, it's another yeah. solid Camco RPG. Yes. All right. Uh, next game is called under leaves developed by circus Atos published by red deer games released February 25th on the switch March 5th on Xbox one for 1299 relax looking for hidden objects in a gorgeous hand painted scenery under leaves will take you on a journey around the world where you'll discover charming animals and beautiful landscapes 
Cole, tell us about your time with Under Leaves. This is one of the most relaxing and yet difficult hidden object games I've ever played. <laughs> I I was first intrigued by it by the art style. We all know I like watercolor. I paint with watercolor. So when I saw that Under Leaves had this beautiful hand illustrated watercolor um scenery and it was all monochromatic i i just looked at it in awe and was like i have to play this <laughs> because it's beautiful and i just want to look at it um which is great because given that it's a hidden object that's all you're going to be doing with it is <laughs> just staring at it um it's that monochromatic aspect though that makes it such a difficult game. When you first launch, there are two um, two maps that are available to you. And then there are little circles dotted around the map with an animal. When you click on that animal as they become available, um, it takes you to the, that animal's corresponding scene. You will then have a handful of other scenes that you can navigate by pressing on the D-pad. Sometimes you'll be able to go up. Sometimes you'll be able to go down. Sometimes you'll be able to go left or right a few scenes. Um, but each set has its own like designated setup. So if you are in the green jungle, every time you're taken back to the green jungle to help another animal, it's still the same layout. Which makes things a little easier. Um, uh, easy. Yeah. <laughs> now the difficulty comes from your. Let's use the green jungle again for an example. So let's say the lizard in the green jungle wants you to find twelve caterpillars. Now you are searching for caterpillars that are three shades of. Green, usually like say uh, a yellow green and then more of a grass green and then like a dark forest green or what we would call in painting, we would call the color hookers green. And I just felt I had to share that because <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. Um, so uh, you'd have those those three different shades and and those 12 caterpillars are just going to be scattered around. Anywhere from two to six different scenes. And you can move around them and look for them. And then you have a cursor you can click when you find one. So you are looking for green caterpillars among green vines on a green <laughs> jungle background with plants everywhere. It's very easy to feel like everything is just blending together. Yeah. Yeah. So the idea of, well, how hard can it be looking for caterpillars? I will tell you that there were, not necessarily the caterpillars, but there were some of the levels where I had to call in backup and ask D or number one to come look for a second <laughs> because my eyes were just so tired from looking at the same colors and scenes that I couldn't find what I was looking for. I still can't find uh, the acorns. I'm still working on the fucking acorns. The acorns were hard. And if you think, fine, I'll just go and find a guide. Well, good luck They're with that. Randomized. These fuckers are randomized. So you can't even just rely on a guide to tell you. You are just staring and hoping <laughs> that you can find them. Um... I wasn't mad about any of it, though. I forget. I, I wanted to count how many levels there were, and I forgot to because I was so focused on just playing. There's a lot. There's like 25, 30, something like that. There are a ton. And you you go back to, I want to say there's like seven or eight different biomes, if you will, that you go through. Um, there are some ice levels, there's some underwater levels, so it's kind of like a Mario game. Uh, <laughs> there's, there's ice, there's the jungle, there's the deserts, there's the, the plains where you have giraffes and meerkats. It's really delightful. And it will take you a couple of hours to actually get through it. Um, unless you've got incredible eyes. I will say, if you are colorblind, you're out of luck. There are no colorblind assist options. And I don't, 
I don't say that as a knock on the game per se, but just the very nature of how it's played and the aesthetic that it has. There just isn't, you know, anything that they could do about yeah. that. Um, which is, I mean, it's a shame. I would like to see as a quality of life type of feature when you find whatever you're looking for in a scene and you click on it, it disappears. It would be nice if instead of disappearing, if maybe it just like left it there and put a glow or some kind of outline or something around it. That way you had a little bit better of a feel when you're looking through like, oh, I already found like five on this scene. There's probably <laughs> going to be another one. There were there were times where I had to sit and just stop and like look at a scene and try to remember where I had clicked on it at just to try to figure out where I had found things. No, yeah. um, I, I didn't then, really like, run into that because I would just play one scene at a time. And I would go through one scene, find as many as I could, move to the next, find as many, and then just mop up as I went back. That's why you can't find that fucking acorn. <laughs> the acorn's the first one really stumping me, but <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm really enjoying this one as well. 13 bucks on it. What do you think about it? It's beautiful. It plays well. And like I said, if you're colorblind, you're probably going to have issues, but most everybody else is probably going to be okay. Um, I give it a buy it. I, I, I really had a good time with it. It was exactly the kind of game I needed to come back and play after not being able to play games for three <laughs> weeks. And if you're an achievement hunter, don't use hints. Yeah, there's an achievement for not using hints. So... No, Keep don't track use hints. Where your acorns were. Yeah. And don't be like Joe. <laughs> uh, next game is called Revita, developed by Ben Star, published by Dear Villagers, released March 3rd on Steam Early Access for $14.99. In this fast paced twin stick roguelike platformer, you play as an unnamed child descending on an ominous clock tower in pursuit of their last memories. Harvest and sacrifice souls to grow your power in order to challenge procedural encounter rooms and intimidating bosses. Chris, tell us about Revita. Okay, Revita is a sprite-based um, kind of rogue light um, kind of deal. Sorry, I'm pulling up the menu here. <laughs> uh, so yeah, basically, it is as it says um, about this kid who um, basically wakes up on a train um, who and gets off the station into a clock tower. And kind of has no idea how, how they got there. And um, you go through like a tutorial thing and then you uh, lose to a boss and then you end up back at the uh, same station and find out that every time you die, you end up back at the same station with the same mission, but you have no memories. And so, yeah, the point of the game is like trying to go through um, and actually defeat the tower and like recover memories and stuff like that. Um, so like any roguelite like you pick up um upgrades of certain kinds of like your weapons and such and uh defense or whatever um sometimes an extra heart or at least items that could lead to an extra heart um almost no healing items and that's uh that'll that actually comes uh into play very much in this uh particular game but um you basically keep going through and uh only certain special items actually will carry with you uh, through until, you know, you start again. Um, and also soul coins, which you uh, get by defeating enemies. You collect soul points and then 10 soul points equals one soul coin. And those can be traded um, later on for some or other. <laughs> Anyways, uh, the interesting thing about this one is that occasionally... Um, you know, it's procedurally generated, so you never know how often this is going to happen. Uh, it tends to be once every run for me, at least. Uh, you can run into these statues that will ask you if you want to trade some of your life for a power-up. Um, essentially, like, kind of volunteering yourself into becoming a glass cannon. Because, again, there's next to no, like, way to heal your character uh, in, a, in a run, so therefore, you know, you're like let's say four hearts that you start with are very precious and you could give up two of them to get like a shotgun item or maybe it's just like a increase in damage by a certain percentage which of course damage is actually shown on the screen um but you have the option to turn it off and i'll get to the options in a minute that's going to be half the review <laughs> um, 
But anyways, so, you know, you just die and die again and, like, try to get further each time. Um, it's got an interesting twin stick dynamic. Like, you are, are actually, like, platforming and stuff. And they, if you're using a controller, they, by default, um, have the L, um, tr- uh, the shoulder button uh, as your jump button. And then the uh, right trigger button as your gun or your shooting gun. Uh, button your your boomy boom pew pew button <laughs> and um <laughs> and uh you can assign uh those uh however you like you can also give it a one stick mode which uh they recommend against but they do allow that for an option so it's kind of a twin stick shooter but it's also just kind of a just just try not to die shooter um the thing that you'll about this game that to me is uh is the best part is that it is just really full of personality like despite its mysteriousness because you really don't get told very much about like anything in this game and i'm sure it all gets you know revealed towards the end or something like you know because in the metro station uh you might uncover let's say the um what's it called the imprisoned which is this monster that exists in the background you can only see its six glowing eyes and like its giant skull shoulder plates um it's something that will uh that will trade with you if you can find some key uh, special key <laughs> items you, know, you can buy like some fairy dust or something and it's just sitting there behind some curtains and you know looks terrifying uh there's an old man upstairs tending to plants who gives you kind of like the rundown of the story and this mysterious cult that uh that is somehow involved and then there's a bunch of locked off areas that you know are going to become like kind of uh, hub shops and things like that whenever you um, whenever you get far enough in the game. And uh, but yeah, there's just so much personality. Oh, next to the old man, there's a cat that all it does is you, you can pet it and then get a heart, like <laughs> not a heart like that you can use. You just get a heart reaction. Oh, so you can pet the cat in this game. Good. Yes. The uh, the action is really nice and fast, and the soundtrack is really good, and the pixel art is just amazing. This is one of those, like, you know, like, between the pixels and the lighting effects and stuff like that, it very much will blow you away. Um, which is interesting, because, like, the actual dungeon itself occurs in these very small rooms that, you know, you uh, defeat the enemies and, like, move on into an elevator um, into the next floor and things like that. So there's not, like... A whole lot of opportunities at least in the first um collection of levels to like you know really make things uh amazing but i think it's supposed to feel that way because again it's a dank clock tower um and then yeah sometimes you'll run into treasure chests that may require like a certain key that you could get from an a- enemy drop uh sometimes you'll get treasure chests that you can open if you give them one of your hearts you know things like that so it's always this uh this like choice to make between um you know having uh safety and security and then having like you know the best weaponry possible so me i always play glass cannon so this is like really intriguing for me um and i was also very impressed by the fact that this whole game seems to have been made by one person uh one guy called ben star and uh very very impressed with that okay so the other thing about this game, and this is uh, kind of rare for, for you know, sprite-based roguelikes of this ilk, uh, it has a ton of options, including accessibility options. Yay. Um, yeah, you can mess with the display, of course. Like I said, you can turn the damage numbers on and off. You can turn the vibrations and screen shake on and off and, you know, either – or, you know, it starts in the middle of a of – a, of a slider and if you slide it all the way up you can get all the screen shake <laughs> um, but yeah the accessibility controls are actually really nice um for one you actually have the ability to uh take the game speed from its original 100 percent all the way down to um 50 or all the way up to 200 percent nice <laughs> if, you, if you so choose uh you can turn all flashes off if you want uh, you can put an outline around your character, like a kind of glowy outline so that you can see him better, and also one around the enemies. Those are separate options. There's an aim assist slider, so um, if you're not so great at twin stick shooters or you just can't, like, you know, you can't manipulate the platforming and the, the you know, aiming at the same time, then you can... This aim assist has, like, ten different points of, like, articulation here, so it's, like, 
you can basically have it like do most of the shooting for you. Nice. Um, you can you can actually cut enemy damage in half if you so choose, which is very nice. Um, you can dim background. There's lighting options, and you can change the font from uh, 8-bit style to HD. So if you want to have like a, a much more readable font and things like that. Uh, 200% speed, by the way, is insane. <laughs> so, uh, you know, but I guess if you really want a quick game. Yeah, so, if, yeah. if you're ballsy enough. Uh, Pernell, I know you were interested in this one. Do you have any questions for Chris? Pernell's well, dead. Oh, no, no there he's, he is. Well, he, he's resurrected, baby. <laughs> <laughs> Would you say that as someone who, well, do you think this is a worthy to, worthy to jump on like right now? Because I was definitely interested in this game. Um, but you know how I am with like backlogs and stuff. But do you think this is a game that would be worthy of making the bump up the roster? Because, you know, I'm a big fan of like the bullet hell, as you've seen from me playing, um, that scourge bringer game, but yeah. also the idea of the whole tower climbing bit. Well, um, I would say that the gameplay is maybe more akin to like, you know, it, it it's definitely not a bullet hell. I mean, maybe it is later. I don't know. But um, but like it's more like enemies just kind of pop in and like they'll shoot shots at you and stuff like that. And you just kind of got to do more of like a um, running around and, and dodging like them as well as like the actual um, environment, like spikes, and traps and stuff like that. And you can do like wall jumps and everything. It actually feels a little more like a Metroid game um, mm. gameplay wise than a bullet hell. I think that, you know, I play a lot of these kind of games and I'm hardly ever impressed by them, like <laughs> to a degree that I actually really want to keep playing them. Like, I always have fun with them, but I'm never like, oh, yeah, I'm actually really looking forward to playing this after the review. <laughs> this is one of the rare exceptions where I'm actually like, yes, I actually want to see where this goes because it gives you just enough like of the uh, of the story and like in background and it's actually like you know mysterious enough that you know it actually gives me um uh it's, it, it's more intriguing i think cool. but yeah so, as far uh, as like bumping it up to your list i mean i'd say sure <laughs> well 15 <laughs> bucks give us the overall verdict on revita yeah 15 bucks it this is definitely worth it um it is absolutely a charming game it's beautiful um, the action is really fast. It's got just that right difficulty that you can lower if you need to or play it through it twice as fast if you <laughs> so desire, <laughs> um, which I just I was just now trying while I was talking and I was like, oh, <laughs> Proud of you. no, I really like this one. I think it's a buy it. Cool. All yeah. right. Next game is called Risk System, developed and published by Newt Industries, released March 5th on Xbox One for $9.99. High speed kinetic action. Danger is the best offense. Pernell, tell us about Risk System. Oh, nine ninety nine. That's a good price point. Um, so Risk System is actually a pretty solid two D side scrolling shooter in that it does some things differently than what you're used to in your t traditional shooter games. So, for example, there are only six stages, but I guess that's not too far off. A lot of shooters these days are like six stages. It's all about the high scores anyway, which this game has in spades. However, it's the gameplay that makes it special. So, for one, you do not have to press the button to fire the gun. Your gun fires automatically when an enemy is in the path of your ship. And honestly, I like that because, really, when are you not firing your gun in a shooter in a 2D schmuck? Uh, so, they take care of that for you. Which is kind of nice because you'll be busy doing other things like not dying because the way this game works and what makes it particularly special is that your ship thrives on danger and it thrives on risk, hence risk system. Um, as you're playing the game, bullets will come flying at you from the side of the screen. Enemies will be trying to crash into you. Bullets will be flying at you from the background of the screen. Uh, and all the time this is happening... You are trying to get as close to all those things without getting hit as humanly possible because you want your ship to get excited because of the danger. Um, as you are grazing bullets and grazing uh, enemies, your, your bullets that are being fired will get slightly more powerful, which is good. Um, but in addition to that, you will also juice up a charge, charge meter. And when that charge meter maxes out, 
You can press the button to pretty much flash bash the entire screen, which includes enemies in the background, which is very important because that's literally the only way you can hurt enemies in the background. Um, that in and of itself is what makes this game so special. There's also two buttons that let you do like a barrel roll, one that goes hor- one that goes horizontally and one that goes vertically. Uh, and it's fan- no, sorry, one that goes up and one goes down. That's what it is. No, neither of them go left or right. Um, but that's the, honestly all the game has as far as the controls, but that's also why it's so damn special because you're spending your entire game trying to get in the cut into proximity of certain enemies. Um, other times you might find yourself in a predicament where you need to get that risk system maxed out because a side effect of that explosion is you're temporarily invincible. So if you need to graze your way through like a piercing laser, you'll unleash the beast and then cross through it before it wears off. The game takes very much advantage of this by having a lot of enemies that one will attack you from the background. Sometimes bosses are as such, which means you need to have it boofed up by then. And other times they'll also take advantage of it by way of having projectiles that are really hard to dodge unless you phase through them. The gameplay with all this in mind is a blast for me. Like the game is one of those games where it's short, but just long enough for you to feel like you got your fill of the system and play. There's a narrative there too with good voices, but I also didn't really care about the narrative because Khan just like, Hey, I'm a girl. I got this <laughs> ship. And he's like, okay, girl with ship, go get those weapons. You're like, okay. And there's stuff talking. But I never really got into that. Um, but the gameplay is 100% solid. I like the lighting effects on certain areas. Like there's a level that takes place during a storm and the lightning that strikes is kind of cool to look as, you know, it affects the whole screen and everything. It's, it's a good game. It's a lot of fun. The music is good. The battles are good with the bosses and even the enemies are pretty solid. Like they don't have like an insane number of a variety, like say a Gradius or something like that, but there's still enough enemies where I'm like, Hey, little cool little drill bomb that's shooting bullets at me. Or, hey, that weird, you know, giant ball rocket that's shooting bullets at me. Or, Hey, look, that floating circle that's firing bullets at me. Point is, I'm okay with the enemy level diversity too. So in the end, at the 999 price point, I think this is honestly a solid value. If this was like 20 bucks, I'd say maybe. But then again, like I said earlier, a lot of shooters lately are dropping for like 30 and 40 bucks. And they're like six levels of high speed arcade action. <laughs> so really, I'd almost be even being unfair to this game if I were making that distinction. But also, ultimately, as a shmup, I think it's a fun time. It brings a unique perspective to it in the sense of especially doing as a, being as an indie shooter. Um, it brings a nice, unique perspective to this comp to like, these kinds of games, and I think it is. Well, you should probably do that thing you do where I give the follow up to, and you're, we'll go you're from like there. doing it without me even asking anymore. I like I don't need to be a host anymore. You could just talk and handle everything. That's, that's not true. You don't need me anymore. Per tangents. Then we won't know when I'm on tangents. <laughs> you catch me every time. My reviews will be about Booyah Bay recipes if you weren't here. Jesus, <laughs> 10 bucks on Risk System, what do you say? <laughs> I think it's a quality buy and worth your money. Cool, 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 cool. All right, next game is Journey of the Broken Circle, developed by Lovable Hat Cult, published by Nakana.io, released March 12th on Xbox One and PS4 for seven ninety nine. Platforming and storytelling literally go hand in hand in this journey full of love and fun, but also questions. Let's roll on a life-changing experience. Cole, tell us about Journey of the Broken Circle. This is one of those games where you're wondering how it's actually going to fit into the genres that it's listed as when you first start playing it. Um, How the fuck do you make a broken circle platform? When I say that it is a broken circle, you are literally playing as a white circle that is missing a triangular piece, like a pie piece taken out of it, right? Yeah. And so, like Pac Man rolling around on his face. Yeah, kind of like Pac Man. Um, he has the ability. Well, he. It. Uh, it's a circle. It. Uh, they have the ability to jump and roll. How the fuck do you make that platform? By jumping. The trick is, well, you can jump to an extent, <laughs> but you cannot jump high. Initially, after you do a little bit of rolling and there's some exposition about missing a piece of yourself and looking for somebody to fill that void, you will come across 
a a pine seed, pine cone, I guess, pine cone. And the pine cone is named Sticky. Of course, you are a circle, obviously. And you, as the circle, and Sticky will merge together to make a circle with a pine cone sticking out of it. This is where the platforming starts to pick up, and then it becomes very obvious how you can make a circle be a platformer. <laughs> because now with Sticky as part of your circle, you are able to actually grab a hold of walls and, and kind of launch yourself into some, some more unique situations. I said it. I said the magic word. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Chris is like, she did it. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Um, but it wouldn't be a good narrative game if joining together with Sticky was enough. You're still not technically a complete circle, right? Because mm-hmm. a pine cone doesn't fill a circle, but it suits your needs for the time being. Sticky has their own agenda, though. Sticky needs to find somewhere to set down roots and become a tree. So once Sticky finds that place where they want to be, they'll leave you. And then you're a broken circle again. And at this point, the narrative falls a little more into despair and angst. And how do you find somebody to fill yourself? What I'm trying to say is this this whole narrative platformer experience about a broken circle is actually a really deep story about breakups and relationships. (laughs) And I was not ready for any of it. (laughs) The more I kept going through it, I was like, but somebody just needs to tell the circle to be fine as a circle. (laughs) I was so... (laughs) My my mother of teenage daughters, who was always like, you don't need no man, you're amazing as you are, uh, just wanted to, like, tell the circle to just be a circle (laughs) and be happy about it. And as the game went on... You continue to experience the circle's relationships and and how they have an effect both on the circle, but also on the others that um, go along on the journey with the circle. Uh, It's really creative storytelling and it's, it's pretty solid gameplay. There are certainly some areas I'm trying not to get too far into spoiler territory as, as crazy as that sounds for this game. (laughs) But I don't, I don't want to spoil anything, but like there's, there's some really neat mechanics that crop up given the types of combinations of, of characters that Circle interacts with to try to fill their void. Um, I will say, in addition to the actual narrative story, there are two secret bonus stages for this game. And one of which is called the Good Trip. And the other's called the bad trip. There is an achievement for making it to the top of the hill in the bad trip. And I need to give a little bit more um, explanation for this. You find mushrooms throughout the game. That's how you unlock these bonus levels. And when you play the bad trip bonus level, you have Circle, who, like I said, looks like a little Pac-Man dude, right? And out of the, the broken part, which would be like Pac-Man's mouth, sprouts a mushroom. Sometimes the mushroom gets a little longer. Sometimes it gets a little shorter. If you can actually control it, I can't fucking figure out how. (laughs) And you're supposed to climb this straight up hill with that mushroom. Nothing has infuriated me more than this fucking level (laughs) ever. First off, The whole thing is like a bad acid trip. So there is constant clashing colors that are are flashing back and forth. Aki could never play this level. Um, If you have any kind of... I I saw the photosensitivity warning, and I beat the game, and I was like, why was there a fucking photosensitivity warning? It's all because of this level, and it is bad. There's, There's no means for controlling it. And it's just one of those where, like, the devs have thrown it in just to torment you. And if it weren't for the achievement tied to it, 
I probably would have spent maybe 15 minutes, got frustrated and said, fuck it and left it alone. But the achievement whore in you is there. It and- is my last achievement, though. <laughs> and I shit you not when I say I spent more time getting halfway up that hill in that level than I did beating the rest of the game. Oh, my Lord. And I can't do it. <laughs> Well, maybe Why they'll listen they and give that? you some feedback, but the bad trip aside, eight bucks on this one. What are you thinking of it? Beyond that, everything else is really great. I, I think it can be a little tropey, the story is. I'm not going to say it's like groundbreaking or anything, but I do think it's a really unique way to t- oh, I did it again. <laughs> tell this story. It's a unique experience. Uh, <laughs> Um, oh, but I you. do think it's <laughs> it's a creative way to tell this this story, even if it is one that's kind of um, tropey. But at least it's also kind of relatable in that way. Um, so yeah, and and other than the parts that infuriated me, again, I can't get into the without spoiling anything. But there were a couple of parts that were unnecessarily difficult other than just the bad trip. <laughs> but um, <laughs> but other than that, I, I think it was a really good time, and I enjoyed it, and I enjoyed completing it if I could just actually complete it. I believe in you. He'll get it. Like three years from now. Yeah, it's still getting I'll it. load it up because I'll be mad, and I'll be like, look at that, I could have done this shit! <laughs> <laughs> Uh, speaking of shit that you can't do, the n- final game to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's so mean. Uh, final game to talk about tonight is called The Commission 1920 Organized Crime Grand Strategy, developed by 2.30 AM Studios, published by 302 Interactive, released February 11th on Steam for fourteen ninety nine. dollars Stake your claim on the city of New Shore in this gritty simulation of 1920s organized crime as the Don get involved with the rackets and politics that define the Prohibition era. Claim your place among mafia history. How will you rule New Shore? Uh, Chris and Cole, you both cover this one. Uh, we had an interview on this one a few weeks ago. We were supposed to cover the game already, but Cole, you being out kind of put a, a kibosh on that for a while. Same with me. Yeah, you were both both gone indisposed for a little bit. So now everyone's here together. What do the two of you think of this game? Flip a coin. Who wants to start? <laughs> Not it. <laughs> I went the longest without power, so Chris has to do it. <laughs> Jeez. Zing. Well, Chris, I think you actually got into this game a lot more than Cole and I were able to because you said you were doing some deep diving on YouTube and watching some tutorials and stuff, right? <laughs> Yes. Um, okay. So the the reason why everybody is uh, so reticent on uh, on this game, <laughs> the the two people reviewing it, that is, um, is because it's a little bit. Um, it's it's got a learning wall. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not, not a, just curve, a curve, a wall. It, like it's, you, yeah. you load the game and then you go, what? <laughs> yeah, what what do I do? <laughs> I like it actually took me a while to even figure out that like you could zoom in on specific neighborhoods because I was playing with a controller mm-hmm. and I didn't realize that you can like expand the uh, the different territories further. Um, so, yeah, like I was really what what happened is that. Um, OK, so this is a strategy game. Um, that is like a strategy game fan strategy game like it is like pure strategy like i would dare say there's not graphics in this game (laughs) no there are it's just like you look at a map um and actually i should rewind a little bit and say that first you have to set yourself up um so this is a game that basically takes place in the prohibition era which is the the roaring 20s and um you basically pick one of uh i think it's five different crime families that you want to be each one has it having its own like kind of unique flair that is to say some of them are more violent some of them are a little bit better at you know um at politics you know things like that and all of these are going to come into play in the actual game so it's kind of worth it to like kind of study up on this game as you're playing it because it's very hard to just dive in because again it's a wall i will say um, I'll I'll interject here. Sure. I wish the game 
did a better job of explaining how the different effects for the families actually changed your game. Yeah. It's it's very vague into <laughs> like, oh, if I choose this family, what happens over if I choose a different one? I found a lot of times when I would start a new game, I'd just be like, pick one at random and see what happens. Because yeah. I didn't actually <laughs> have a basis for understanding how it was going to actually affect anything. And that's another thing is that, like, you know, it kind of... Since there are so many ways to approach the game strategically, it's just kind of like which one sounds the most like you. What mm -hmm. what sounds like it's the thing that you would be the most interested in, and that's that's kind of where I took it. So I picked the um, seemingly non confrontational but um, but somewhat savvy uh, Junio family. <laughs> they were like they don't like to fight. I was like, oh yeah, me neither. So let's go ahead and go with that. <laughs> Anyways. Um, but yeah, like to really get into like how the game works mechanically and stuff, I ended up watching like, uh, some YouTube videos, which are, you know, they got some let's plays on there that really go in step by step and explain how you're doing everything. So if you load up this game and you find yourself confused, that's a good way to like get yourself untangled from that and start playing. Um, otherwise you're probably very smart and you're thinking, gosh, this guy is an idiot for not getting this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, <laughs> Because, yeah, once you start your crime family, um, you basically uh, you end up on this map with these different boroughs of not New York City. <laughs> I think New is it's like New Shore City or something like yeah, that. Yeah, New like Shore. That. Yeah. And uh, if you zoom in with your mouse, then each one of these areas will then like uh, expand into like different neighborhoods within that kind of borough. And then you can expand it further. Oh, my cat's yelling at me. Hang on. Okay. Cole, what are your thoughts <laughs> while he steps away? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm done. Or, I mean, I'm, I'm here. Um, the, the biggest thing for me, and I, I feel like we harped on this quite a bit during the interview, and I do feel bad about it, but I think it's the biggest thing about the commission, is that even if you are a hardcore strategy player, and I, I like to think I am. I play a fuck ton of strategy games. That's my shit. Um, even if you are a strategy player, there's not a lot to guide you into this actual game. So, like Chris is saying, oh, well, I didn't know I could zoom in on the burrows. I knew to zoom in on the burrows, and I still didn't know what to do with them once I was there. There's not enough to explain how you can, um, you know, recruit new, new members to your, to your family to, yeah. to get them to work for you. Uh, it was like when I did these kind of things, when I set up a racket for a job to, to make money or when I sent, gave somebody a promotion or sent them to a borough, it was all just because I fumbled around and did it on accident and it worked. <laughs> no. And, um, that's my biggest beef with the game. Like, I can I can figure out the strategies. I can figure out how to 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 make money and and to you know do shakedowns as long as the game points me in a direction of where I need to even just start. But there was no option for that with the commission. It's just like, well, here's your city. Good luck, and it, <laughs> and and doesn't tell you, hey, if you click on this borough and then you send. Um, a person there, then you need an underling for them. Like I had to figure all that stuff out just because they were like, it would occasionally throw up a, an icon telling me that I didn't have <laughs> the right kind of person in the right kind of area. Um, once I actually like fumbled my way through it enough to get a footing, I did fine and it was okay. And I think that there's, there's definitely going to be a, an audience who, you know, enjoys these kind of mafia strategy sims. And this is a good one for that kind of player. But if you are just trying to get a, a, a foot in the door or find a handhold in the wall, you're SOL. Mm -hmm. You're not doing it. You just have to click and fail. And that's, that's a lot harder of a sale for a lot of people. <laughs> well, I mean, it's, yeah, it, because that's the thing is that, like, it doesn't give you very much straightforward action. Like, this is the kind of game where you can click confirm or you you can click, like, 
oh, this family is in this area doing something suspicious. You can click, like, attack them. And then it just, like, attacks them and kind of rolls the dice on whether you won or not, right? Like, that's the combat in this game. Mm -hmm. However, in the politics version, you need to know the difference between bribing a police chief and a district attorney (laughs) and what that's going to do for you in order to, like, get the most out of your game. However, what I do kind of like is that the game is relatively low stakes. Like, you can't get murdered. Um, You can't, you also can't, like, take over the whole map and murder all the other crime families. It's not that kind of game. It's more like, what can you do to maximize your influence and your um, and your money making like scheme and stuff until you know? I I should assume the end of prohibition. I actually don't know how long you can play this game. <laughs> Is it like Sim City where you can go into like the twenty nine hundreds and it's still like nineteen twenties era? <laughs> it might be. I'm That'd not be sure, great because I didn't I didn't make it that far. I I made it a few years, but I didn't uh, I didn't get out of the. Historical Years, prohibition era. Yeah. Twenty-eight. <laughs> the robots well, have taken over. Prohibition yeah. is still an act. <laughs> exactly. And there's a strip joint all over Rochester. <laughs> no, I'm I'm just kidding. I I could never. I didn't I didn't earn enough money at any point to actually make a strip joint. I mean, <gasps> I club. did. Oh, okay. Well, good on you. I did. Yeah. <laughs> I kept I um. I, well, like the the. Like the kind of conflict of the game is that you want to um, keep your money flowing, but also keep the heat down. And the heat mm-hmm. is, you know, in every area. Uh, and if it goes up too much, then your guys might get arrested. So mm-hmm. you got that's where you got to like um, bribe politicians or you know police or like influence elections and things like that. Like you actually <laughs> influence like political elections in this town. Yeah, like it's really cool how deep it goes. It's just that you gotta learn how to swim first, and that's the uh, that and I it think throws is, you in the deep end right away. <laughs> and they throw you in the deep end. They don't just the throw you off the boat; they throw you off the boat under the rudder <laughs> and just oh, wow. like bye. <laughs> and then, I mean, once I got my bearings about me with it, I had a good time, yeah. and I think it's a really well done strategy game. But it just needs to be more beginner friendly, more accessible, more approachable. Yeah. Yeah, And we said this in the interview, but I think like just a a playable like what a lot of RTS games do, like a Mm -hmm. playable tutorial. That is to say, it shows you, you know, because what it has right now, (laughs) what it has right now is that every time you click on something for the first time, it will pull up a splash screen that will tell you about it but again they use terms that you don't really understand Mm because they're like explaining about soldatos and like you know like all this all these italian words you're supposed to know and you're just like well what do i click on this to make money (laughs) yeah where do i click what do i do and um like i said i i went the the youtube tutorial route and that's where i got to actually start playing and um i will say i did try to bomb and lose as much money as possible (laughs) but um I never went wow. broke. I don't know. I have, I think, I got, two cents I got left. Pretty, <laughs> you had two I cents got left. pretty close a couple of times, but that's usually when I was like <laughs> purposely hitting in turn over and over till to make <laughs> enough money to buy something else. I just I wanted it to move to like a splash, like a, a you know an image of like this gangster mob boss sitting on the corner of the street with the tin cup <laughs> <laughs> and his pockets see if it out. Happen. Yeah, but yeah, pockets out, shaking his head, <laughs> forlornly, <laughs> jumping on the rail line. Yeah, but oh I will say, <laughs> <laughs> at at the end of the day, I really appreciate uh, that there is like that exists something this clinical and this like deep. Like it's clearly made with a lot of like passion yeah. for for the strategy aspect of it. It's just yeah, it. Scaling the wall, diving under a boat, or whatever other metaphors we came up with, that is a concern. <laughs> well, 15 bucks, I need a verdict. What do the two of you think? I I am willing to go with a solid try it. I just have to, I can't like full on go, oh yeah, buy it, because it's so hard to get started. But the if you're one of those hardcore fans, if you are just willing to get thrown under the boat <laughs> into a vat of piranhas, then yeah, you're you're probably gonna have a good time. You're gonna be fine. And that's great. It, it's this is 
that's the kind of player that the commission is for. And if you're more casual, then it's it's going to be a harder a harder sale. Yeah, I agree with that. I I give it a the highest try it that I can. That is to say <laughs> it's only a try it because it's a niche product. Yeah. Um, your average gamer might not understand it, but a that's okay. Respectable try. <laughs> a res- yes, exactly. Raider Biz is let down. Raider Biz was hoping for a fuck it, why not tonight? Uh, that's too expensive. We can't. We can't give a fuck it, why not to anything over ten bucks. Yeah, <laughs> that's I, true. I think Dreaming Dense Sarah rules. would have been the best opportunity for a fuck it, why not? Indeed. How much was it? Five bucks. Oh, yeah, yeah. Brunel, do you want to change your, your vote on Dreaming Sarah to a fuck it, why not? <laughs> never! <laughs> never! <laughs> fuck you, <Yeah>. never! <laughs> oh, God. Well, we made it through another episode. Uh, thanks, everyone, for being here. Cole, thanks for telling us about your the ice storm again, because you're going to keep me Everybody. awake with nightmares. Of I, these, of these tree have, snapping, like that's legit fucking trauma. Right? <sighs> you're gonna, you're going to infect all of us with these fears I s- now. I swear, Dude. the way she says it, it's like I'm torn between like, like, oh, cool story versus like feeling bad because it's like she's like I'm still traumatized. I was like, oh, I feel bad. That's yeah. definitely important. But she's like, oh, I got trauma for days. Like, well, <laughs> are you, are you, are you, en- are you enjoying the proclamation? I don't know what's happening right now. <laughs> trauma for I'm day. so disgustingly like joyful that I can't be like, I'm traumatized. <laughs> I, I have to be like, that shit was awful. <laughs> I can't think that's that's uh... The best dance number is I might need counseling what the fuck was that? That was a terrible storm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And now I need to go to some counseling. <laughs> like, like, have just... you ever have you ever seen ass falling from the sky? I know I I'm trying not to say it like I say ass, but <laughs> have you ever seen ass fall from the sky while there's fucking lightning over the hill? Like I was watching over the hill and I was like, why is there somebody on the hill with a spotlight? And then it dawned on me that that wasn't some motherfucker standing on the hill with a spotlight. It was lightning. Yeah, I, I'll admit, I don't think I've ever witnessed snow simultaneously at the same time as, like, lightning in the sky. Like, usually Thunder lightning- snow is crazy to watch. Yeah, it is. But what? it wasn't even snowing. It was it was rain, the but crazy- it was freezing before it hit the ground. Oh, like so, almost like yeah. I've, I've had that happen before, like freezing rain, but not mm-hmm. quite. Yeah, but I've had that happen before. It's weird. Yeah, and so then, like, you could look at the trees, and mm-hmm. you could see where the water had hit when the raindrops would hit, and then start to drip off, and then froze in state. Mm. Yes, I opened a can Shit. of worms in my <laughs> in my wrap up, didn't I? Yeah, I'm sorry. Okay. Oh, Worse than that, I opened a can of Coke Zero. <laughs> <laughs> I have vanilla Coke and Dr Pepper and cream soda. Mountain Dew. I have, I have a plethora of sodas. <laughs> this is just a joyless, fizzy thing. I had a plethora of ass storm. <laughs> oh my god! Does anyone have any final words to end this episode? I have a few paragraphs. Oh Jesus! 